Well, good morning, everybody. Go ahead and grab a copy of God's Word and meet me in Luke chapter 10 this morning as we do a one-off today called Crucial Conversations. Now, while you're heading there, a couple quick announcements. If you want to give, you can online at harvestphiladelphia.org. Also, you can send checks into the church office that address is below. Also, we're excited to uh, be on-ramping a new elder over the next month. Um, we're giving you time and opportunity to get to know Sherwin and his family, ask him any questions. His email will again be uh, below. You can email him and uh, ask him any questions that you want during this time. And uh, today we're going to be in Luke chapter 10, and I want to read uh, the essence of our text today where we're going to spend a lot of our time. In Luke chapter 10, it says in verse 25, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, that is Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, Well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But... Uh, he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Today we want to have a crucial conversation, a hard conversation about justice and race. Um, and I'm hoping that this conversation will blossom into more conversations down the road. Um, but for today, unless you've been living under a rock for the past month, you are aware that our country has been essentially turned upside down uh, ever since the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. It has sparked, uh, this event has sparked nationwide conversations about justice and race and hard conversations, especially for the church. And I think there's a lot of reasons as to why this conversation is hard within the context of the church. And Kevin DeYoung wrote a good article on the Gospel Coalition page about this. But I think the biggest reason that he targets as to why it's hard for the church to discuss this is because we can't agree on the severity of the issue. Now, Kevin DeYoung used a great analogy. He said, imagine on a scale of 0 to 100 the severity of the issue. A zero is heaven, and a hundred is chattel slavery. And back in the days when we still had transatlantic slave trade in America. Well, we're clearly not there, and we're clearly not in heaven. Okay, so if we back it up a little get, bit, maybe 80 to 90 uh, would represent the Jim Crow law era, and we're not there anymore. So where are we? Um, and some people would say, well, in America, the severity of the problem is maybe a 20, you know, racism is largely an issue of the past, still happens, but it's relatively seldom. It's mostly individualistic and pretty isolated. But other people would say, well, it's a 70. Um, that is racism, uh, race issues and injustice. It's systemic. It's baked into the DNA of our, uh, of our, uh, of our country. And it's what our country is really built upon. And so what do we do? And by the way, both of these opinions exist within the church. So what do we do when we have such differing thoughts, opinions, and experiences when it comes to these issues? Now, the goal of our conversation today is not so much to answer every question. We couldn't possibly do that in one Sunday or even a one-month series. But... Um, and today may raise more questions than it may answer. But the goal today is to answer this question. In this cultural moment right now, how do I love my neighbor? How do I love my neighbor in this cultural moment and beyond? How do I love my neighbor? If I'm a 20 and my neighbor is a 70, how do I love them? If I'm a 70 and my neighbor is a 20, how do I love them? If I'm a 40 or a 50, how do I love both sides? And I think the parable of the Good Samaritan is going to be helpful for us as a church because our goal here today is not so much to answer every question, but to begin the conversation and to do it in a way that creates unity and I hope a path of healing in our church and beyond. 
But it says here, and before I begin, let's pray. Father, we need your guidance today as we walk through this text. We thank you, God, for the authority of your word. And God, though we are impacted deeply and profoundly by our experiences, we thank you, God, that ultimately our authority is not our experience, it's your word. And so, Father, help us to anchor ourselves, our emotions, our thoughts, and what we choose to do moving forward in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so let's begin here in the text in verse 25. Let's read it again. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, Jesus, to the test. Now, this lawyer in the text is likely um, an expert of the biblical Old Testament law, likely a scribe or a Pharisee. And he puts Jesus to the test. Now, this parable And this context of the lawyer standing up to ask Jesus a question is coming on the heels of what happened about four verses earlier in in chapter 10, verse 21, where Jesus proclaimed to this crowd um, that the so-called wise lacked true understanding of God. And so this lawyer, probably a Pharisee or a scribe who is obviously offended, he stands up to test Jesus, to trap him with a relatively basic question about religion Teacher, what shall I do, verse 25, to inherit eternal life? And I think it's providential that in this text, God has appointed a lawyer to stand up and ask this question because this lawyer is rising up to defend himself and his people. He's rising up, he's lawyering up to defend his position, to, uh, to defend his opinion. He is becoming, as it says here in the text, self-defensive, as we are going to see later. And I think it's helpful for us to recognize that, especially when it comes to situations like this, where there's a lot of opinions, a lot of debate, and we don't necessarily know how to think clearly about these things, it's easy to run to our positions and our opinions and lawyer up and just become defensive. And I would ask you, as we begin this conversation, to not lawyer up to not put God to the test, but rather just to lay down your defensiveness if it's rising up in you and ask God just to give you ears to hear. Moving on, it says in verse 26, he said to him, what is written in the law? Answering the question, how do I inherit eternal life? How do you read it? Now, Jesus here in the text is not asking for a recitation of the entire law. He's really asking for this guy to give him the heart of the law. And so he reads that. He sees, or we see this in verse 27. He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, and he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Translation, obey these two commandments fully and you'll inherit eternal life. Now, If you don't know much about the scribes and the Pharisees, um, these were people who prided themselves on their ability to maintain the entirety of the Old Testament law. I mean, the Pharisees literally tithed a tenth of their spice rack. And they did that because they thought in keeping the Old Testament law, they could earn for themselves eternal life on their own. But what Jesus is getting at here is not so much can you keep the entirety of the law. The question behind the question is, do you get the heart of what these laws that you keep are really all about? Do you really love God with every fiber of your being, every minute of the day? Do you really meet the needs of your neighbor with all the joy, energy, and fastidiousness with which you meet your own needs? And Jesus' point here, as a side note, is to prove that this is an impossibly high standard. And none of us can do that. None of us can love God every minute of every day with all of our heart. And none of us love other people with the same measure of love that we love ourselves. And that was the point. Because he was trying to show this man that you can't save yourself by your own merits. If you could, Jesus didn't need to come. Jesus did not need to die. He was trying to show this man through questioning and asking him about his understanding, his perceptions of the Old Testament law. He was trying to show him that only Jesus himself can save this man. We need grace. We need forgiveness to be reconciled with God. And this lawyer doesn't get the hint, though. Uh, He's not picking up on the cues. And he thinks, so what he does here in the text in the next verse is he, he thinks of a question to squirm his way out from 
under the pressure. So verse 29, he says, but he desiring to justify himself, to defend himself, he lures up again. He said to him, and who is my neighbor? Now, what he's doing here in the text is he wanted to soften the hard edges of the law to maintain his sense of self-righteousness. Um, translation, he's saying, well, of course, I, I love the people who keep your law. I love the people who keep God's law, but you don't actually expect me to love people the way I love myself who don't keep the law, do you? You, you don't actually expect them to be my neighbor. And at the heart of what this question is getting at is this man had figured out a way to draw lines around certain people so that he would not have to love or care about them. He'd figure out, he had figured out a way to justify discrimination toward other people. And we have to recognize that in the heart of this man is a problem that is inherent in the heart of every human being on the face of the planet, is this tendency, this propensity for us to want to um, draw lines, to discriminate, draw lines around certain people so we don't have to love, so we don't have to care for them, so that we don't have to show concern for certain people with all the joy and energy and fastidiousness with which we show ourselves. Now, Eric Postelak, who's a, a friend and a pastor in Chicago, he, he made a good note that we tend to draw lines uh, based on a lot of different things. Sometimes we draw these lines around people based on their clothing. Well, they look like a quote unquote thug or a prep, or they look poor, they look weird. And so we draw lines around them because that way we don't need to care for them or love them quite as much as we should. Or sometimes we draw lines around people based on their accent. Well, they sound foreign or snooty. They sound uneducated. Sometimes we draw lines around people based on their skin tone, their darkness or their lightness. Sometimes we draw lines around people based on their communication style. Well, they're loud to quiet or bubbly to serious or posture. A look at how they walk or how they sit or how they gesture or how they wear their clothing. Gender, men women, age, millennials, or boomers, profession, you're a salesperson, I'm a lawyer, police officer. You see, what Jesus was doing is he reads the heart of the man, and he could see in his attempt to justify himself that he was trying to draw lines around certain people so that he could say, well, these clearly are not my neighbor. So in response, Jesus tells a story, like he often does, and I think the reason why he tells the stories here is because stories have a way of getting past our objections and helping us to get to the heart of what really matters. So he says in verse 30, Jesus replied, a man was going down to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho. So this was likely a Jewish man going from Jerusalem, his home down to Jericho, passing through Samaria, and fell among some robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. So if he didn't get some help, he's probably gonna die. Verse 31, now by chance, a priest, another Jewish man, was going down the road, and when he saw him, he helped him. What does it say? Does it say he helped him? It says he passed on the other side. In other words, he went out of his way to get as far away from this man as possible and avoid him. Now, we don't know exactly why. The text doesn't say, but I, I think we can safely conjecture that maybe he thought it was too dangerous, or maybe he just didn't want to get involved, maybe he didn't know what happens, or maybe he just didn't want to take the time and the energy and the cost that would be necessary to help this man. Whatever it is, maybe he didn't have the time. Whatever it is, he chose not to get involved. In verse 32, likewise, a Levite, a Levite was an aide in the temple, also a Jewish person. When he came to him, verse 32, to the place and saw him, he passed on the other side. He didn't want to get involved either. But verse 33, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had stopped. Now, if you've never read this account before, if you were in the audience with Jesus and you were hearing this for the first time, you would assume that when Jesus is describing what the Samaritan was about, he, you, would, you would expect him, when he saw him, he, you would expect him to say, he had, the Samaritan had contempt 
for this man or hatred. or Maybe he took one extra kick uh, in the ribs for the guy because you have to understand that there was incredible animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans, if you don't know, were the children of Jewish people uh, who had mingled and intermarried with Gentiles, which was a big no-no. And so as a result, they had been rejected by both people groups, by Gentiles, by Jews. And as Tim Keller in his book, uh, Generous Justice, which has been incredibly helpful uh, uh, for this sermon today, uh, he said, and I quote, that these were racial half-breeds considered by Jews and Gentiles. They were half-breeds. And further, they were religious heretics, thus rejected by Jews and Gentiles. And further to punctuate the hostility between them, Jesus in Luke chapter 9, just a chapter before, was traveling from uh, one place to Jerusalem, and he was trying to stay in Samaria to to pick up lodging. And when they found that he was heading toward Jerusalem, the Samaritans kicked him out. There was great hostility. So you would expect this Samaritan to look to this Jewish man with a sense of, you got what you deserve, contempt, contempt. And yet, look at what it says here in the text. The man was moved with what? Not hatred, uh, not contempt, not indifference, compassion. Um, And that doesn't mean that he felt bad for the guy. It doesn't mean he just prayed over him. There was action in his compassion. Look what it says in verse 34. He went to him and it bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his animal and brought him to an inn to take care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Now watch verse 36. Here's the crucial question and the point of the text. Which of these three, Jesus asks, do you think to the lawyer, prove to be the neighbor, be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Who do you think was the man who loved his neighbor more? Now, what is Jesus doing here in the story? He's he's asking a couple of questions along the way in a story format. First, what does it mean to love my neighbor? And clearly from this passage, we can see that love is more than simply a sympathy. Um, it's more, if, if you're a 20 and you see someone who is a 70 when it comes to these justice and race issues, it's more than just saying something on Facebook or offering your sympathy or condolences or thinking about it for a day or two and then never thinking of it again. It's clearly more than that. Because to love your neighbor requires action of some kind. And at the bare minimum, I would imagine that an action like Job's friends would be required. An ability or a willingness, at least, when Job had been injured and hurt and lost, to be willing to sit in the ashes with Job and weep with him and mourn with him and enter into Uh, his despair for a season with him. That, I think, at the very minimum, is what this text would call us to do. Romans 12, verse 15, weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn. What does it mean to love your neighbor? That's a crucial question that we have to answer in these times right now. But also is begging the question, who do we love? And we are called to love those who clearly are different than us. As I said several weeks ago, what I love about the body of Christ is that we can have unity in diversity. We can love those who dress different, sound different, look different, talk different, don't walk the same, uh, don't have the same assessment of what is going on in our country right now. We are still called as the body of Christ to love people more than our personal opinions. And we tend to draw lines so that we know who we need to love and who we are free to ignore. And we have to recognize here in this text that Jesus is erasing a lot of those lines. He's not erasing truth. He's not erasing truth. 
but he's erasing the lines that we tend to draw around people to give us ourselves permission to not love, to not care, and just ignore. And Jesus erases all these lines and he tells us, love your neighbor with your actions, not just your words. And Paul reiterates this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are the household of faith. Now, as we wrap up here in verse 37, Jesus said this, to the one who showed, or the, the I'm sorry, the, the lawyer answers, um, who was the better neighbor? He answers in verse 37, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus replies to him, you go and do likewise. Look, in this cultural moment, I, we recognize that this is a really hard time in our country, and it's gonna be a hard time in the church especially if we don't start having this conversation. And I think it's pivotal for our, our understanding at the beginning of this conversation to recognize that Jesus has called us to love our neighbor. And if, our na- if we're a 20 and our neighbor is a 70, we're called to love. If we're a 75 and our neighbor is a 20 or a 10 or a zero, we are called uh, to love them. We are called to love our neighbor, especially those of the household of faith. So the question becomes in our conversation today, how do we do this well? I think a couple of thoughts as I close out this time, we've got to do less lawyering up. Um, It's not that we don't educate ourselves. It's not that we don't learn. It's not that we don't get the facts. Absolutely, we do that. But in the context that we're in, less luring up, less news and social media maybe, more relationship, more concern, more demonstrations of care, more conversation, right? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. These are all things that the Bible has called us to do, that God has called us to do. So that's why for the remainder of our time this morning, I'm excited to invite a friend of mine into this conversation. Now again today, we're not gonna try to answer every question. This is a massive issue, but we wanna have the conversation today. And so I'm excited to uh, invite today Pastor Darren Greenfield. Now you know uh, Pastor Darren, he has been at our church multiple times, preached to us, you love him, I love him. Uh, Our church has helped support uh, his church since it began in 2019. And um, he is a friend to our church, but also uh, for me, he's a personal friend. Uh, We have spent time together, we have broken bread together, we have laughed and we have mourned together. He is a personal friend. But here's the thing, we come from very different backgrounds. We have very different experiences and those things inform how we read what's going on in our country. But here's the good news. We share the same Bible and we worship the same Lord, Jesus Christ. He is our ultimate authority. And so that's why we wanna begin this conversation. Now, today is gonna be a one-off. We're gonna come back to this probably in several months. Our elders are really thinking and praying through how to not just kind of hit the cultural topic of the, of the moment, but what does it really mean uh, to approach justice in a biblical way? So with that, we're gonna come back to this in a couple of months, uh, but today I'm excited to have a conversation with my friend, Pastor Darren Greenfield. Would you please welcome him right now? All right. Well, what's going on, everybody? Pastor Matt here with Pastor Darren Greenfield from Christ Centered Church. Yeah, what's going on, guys? Good to be with you and good for you to see me. And I'm hoping I can see you sometime soon, too. Yeah. Well, hey, guys, we are excited to uh, continue this conversation that we started this morning. And um, obviously, with everything going on in our country, unless you've been living under a rock, you know that we got a lot going on in our country. And uh, Pastor Darren, we've, we've seen a lot of dominoes fall. Mm-hmm. They've kind of brought us to where we are. Mm. Maude Arbery, um, Amy Cooper, George Floyd, mm. uh, now the protests, mm-hmm. some of the looting of the riot. And just talk to me a little bit about how is this affecting you and your family personally? Yeah, um, well, so when I first saw it, so the, let's start with Ahmaud Arbery. Um, when I first saw that, I heard about it. I didn't see the videotape. 
and then I actually ended up watching the, the tape by accident. I was watching a news outlet because I told myself I didn't want to watch the tape because I had watched so many tapes before that. Eric Garner, Laquan McDonald, um, all those tapes. And I just felt a certain kind of trauma coming on that it, my emotions were taking me, you know, either into far anger from seeing them or depression from seeing them. And so I felt as though I didn't need to watch the tape to know what happened. But I ended up watching that tape and I could not get the way that he fell after being shot out of my head. Like mm -hmm. just certain times that I just still replay it mm -hmm. in my head. I see the image in my head. So then I actually heard about Amy Cooper before George Floyd because they happened in the same amount of time. Right. right? And just to see how the identity of Amy Cooper was weaponized in that scene. I was just like, man, this is crazy. But I noticed nobody was really talking about Amy Cooper because they were talking about George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And then I caught up on that. And, and, and I thought that I would feel different, but the way that I felt was really numb. Mm -hmm. Like I knew another tear wasn't coming. I kind of accepted that this is the way the uh, uh, sin is running rampant in the world in our, our, our um, uh, in the racial hostility that we have towards one another. Um, but what did really shock me was for those three things to happen in a row, mm -hmm. how silent certain parts or how people perceive the silence or the silence of, of the church. And so I started to look in that a little bit and see what people were saying and just, and just different things like that. And so I would say I was numb. Um, I was observant to see what the response of the church was gonna be. And I told myself when Ahmaud Arbery happened, when I was talking to our people at the church, I said, man, I'm going to stop letting Satan shock me. Mm. Like the world is the world. I'm going to stop saying stuff like I cannot believe this happened because this is Satan's agenda. This is his plan. But I do think that the church has to have a different posture and responsibility in, in trying to work this out, mm. you know, within the church and, and, and before the world. And so, yeah, that's how I felt. Mm. So this is the outworking of sin, right? This is mm -hmm. the fruit of sin. The root is in our hearts. The fruit is the outworking, and this is what it shows up and looks like. And so, um, well, thanks for sharing that. So as a believer in Christ, then, because you know the root of it, um, how do you process these events? You have uh, the Word of God, you have the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and you're a shepherd mm -hmm. to a lot of people who have been impacted by this, mm -hmm. who are grieved mm -hmm. and hurt. How do you how do you filter what you see in our culture through the lens of the Gospel mm -hmm. in your own life, in the life of your family, maybe in the life of your congregants? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing I was on the lookout for is how does the world want me to believe this? Mm -hmm. And the way the world wanted me to see it was totally, they wanted me to take whatever I felt about the situation and automatically apply it to politics first, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because that's what the fuss was about. Right. Like this has happened because this is in power, this is happening because of this. And I think that there is a time to discuss that. Mm -hmm. But the first thing that I needed to do, I'm a, I'm a chart person, like I, I express my feelings uh, uh, through paper. I had to write down what I felt um, what I perceived it was, uh, looked in the scriptures, and then formulate how I should move forward after that. So what do I felt? I felt anger, I felt exhaustion, I felt depression, I felt fatigued, I felt uh, um, um, threatened, I felt those things, uh, you know, so uh, what I felt, what does the scripture encouragement give me at that time, right? Um, um, do not grow weary in doing good, right? Talking about the sovereignty of God and just different things. Well, how should I apply that? You know, um, by first, before we get into a solution, uh, let's see where we are in this as the church. And so even with our people, we were at Bible study the other night, we took a whole night and we're gonna take another one after this and ask three questions. Um, um, how do you feel? What do you need? Mm. Right. Um, and how are you getting that? Mm. How do you feel about these situations? What's good? What's bad? What's showing up in abundance? What's lacking? What do you need? Because a lot of the times we hold this stuff by ourselves. What do you need? Where are you getting that from? Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So just really challenged our church to be relational with one another during this time mm -hmm. um, that some of us are have been through this a couple of times. So maybe we need to be ears. Mm -hmm. Some of us are at the beginning of this. When we're seeing this, we have some teenagers. Maybe we need to place a, vent, a place for them to vent. Uh, some of us are our people at our church are. Uh, white but they have black children that they adopted right and they're coming along in their journey you know um, and how do you feel and so just processing the right way yeah. not processing all off of emotion having my emotions but then giving them to God to see how they output yeah. you know and so it, I, I live the scripture of be angry yet not sin and then flow you know from there because emotions are important to God yep and we can't ignore them mm -hmm. and downplay them. But I think sometimes, do you agree with me on this? It seems like in the church, we, we try to ignore our emotions yeah. as if they're not important. Yeah. Is that unhealthy? That is very unhealthy. Uh, because even if you look at that scripture, be angry yet not sin, anger is a good emotion. Mm. How you use it is the challenge. Mm. So God gave me the right to be angry, mm. right? Uh, God gives us when we see injustice, when we see somebody hurt, when we see something, he gives us the ability to be anger. Now the next question is how will I use my anger, mm. right? And so if you saw how I was, I was trying to give people perspective, you know, throughout this whole time and um, our city went up in flames, Philly went up in flames. Yeah. It was a lot of looting. Yeah. It was a lot of, of rioting. And, and so, so what, I, what I tried to tell people is as a pastor and as a black man, I feel that anger. What's, what stops me from going out and looting and rioting is not that I'm not angry like them. Mm. Is that, that I have a promise from God mm. that when he comes back, mm. that he's going to set all things straight. Wow. I have a command from God that vengeance is not mine, but he does not tell me vengeance will not happen. He tells me he's going to do it. Yeah. So therefore, I don't have to riot here because I trust him yeah. that he's going to take care of what he needs to take care of. Right, so the only thing that separates me from the rioters, not that they're angry and I'm not. Right. We're both angry. Yeah. I'm just as angry as them. I understand their anger, but I trust God enough to wait for him. So the gospel has a radical impact mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. how you address all of this. Yeah. So, and it's interesting because as, as you watch, it's clear that so many people in our country are angry right now. Mm -hmm. it, it seems apparent they don't know where to put the anger, yeah. which is why we're seeing what is happening. Mm -hmm. And so um, praise God that we have a gospel that, that can tell us where to send our anger and how mm -hmm. to use it. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked a lot about the Good Samaritan this morning um, and what it looks like to be a good neighbor and we discovered that um the when the man asks the question um who is my neighbor mm -hmm. he's trying to draw lines around certain people so that he can excuse himself from loving certain people yeah. and we talked about the fact that we can draw lines around uh, each other for a variety of different reasons mm -hmm. and so how do we avoid doing that in the church how do we how do we keep from drawing lines around each other? Oh, you're Democrat, you're Republican, you're black, you're white. You listen to CNN or Fox News. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of there's a lot of lines that we draw around each other, mm -hmm. and I I don't think we realize how much we actually do it. Mm -hmm. but we do it. So what are the first steps that we can be taking to to love each other inside of the church? Maybe start there, and then what does it look to love to love our neighbor outside of the church as right. well? Yeah, um, so that was one of the things that I've been thinking about and I've been talking and to our people about is I think how do we love each other inside of the church and not draw lines is realize that in our, our identity in Christ, we don't have much room for those lines. Mm. That as a child of God, that there are certain things in the world that you may be able to give your opinion to. There are certain things that you can get involved with. But if those lines begin to separate you, from what the blood of Christ has done, 
then there's a value concern there of what you value more than the other, right? And so if I see my brother and sister in Christ as a Republican before my brother and sisters in Christ, right? Then I have uh, taken value away from the death of Christ and what he paid for my life and the redemption for us to be in the same family. And I've taken that value away and given it to the Republican or the Democratic or the Independent, whoever it is, right? And so the first thing I, I, I had to look at is in, in, in my identity as a believer, how much room do I have in my life to be Republican, Democrat, Independent, Green Party, whatever it is? Mm -hmm. It's not much. Mm -hmm. There's not much. And then what I realize mm -hmm. uh, after that is how much room does the church have to be there? Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, came up with this, uh, this goal of mine to, in this time, help the church to become the church in America, the embassy of heaven. Hmm. Which means that we actually benefit the world when we don't get wrapped up in this, hmm. right? Because how we're going to win our neighbor who is outside of the church is when they look at us and they're bringing their complaints and their gripes and, and their justified reasons to hate the brother on the other side. We can say, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, but there's a reason why I can't get involved in that that far. Why? Because what separates you, Jesus has conquered and brought us closer, mm. right? And so it was just all about my Christian identity, right? I am a believer in Christ first. Mm. Jesus, what do I have room for? If things are trans, uh, if things are crossing the lines and trespassing and messing with me and my brother and Jesus Christ, then we got to get those out of the way, mm. right? Yeah. And then um, understanding what's earthly and what's eternal. Yeah. I, I, Matt, Pastor Matt, I don't know. I don't think it's going to be a Republican or Democrat or independent party in heaven. What am I fighting so hard for here on this side? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That God is sovereign. Mm. That he's going to work it out. So that's one thing. And then it just smacked me in the gospel when I've been reading the gospel through this. Um, why would Jesus promise us something that he did not give to those he walked the earth with? He told them he was not a political redeemer. Mm -hmm. He will not be their political leader. Yeah. Some stuff is just going to get figured out in this earth. Some stuff is just going to happen until he comes. I need to find the proper way to steward my identity and all of that. And so it was an identity thing for me, stewarding my identity. So what I hear you saying is it's not that politics aren't important, mm -mm. but they, they have to, as, as Jesus says, if you do not hate your mother and your father and your, and your wife and your children, your brother and your sister, um, he, he's not saying we actually have to hate them. Mm -hmm. He's drawing, he's using a hyperbole to mm -hmm. draw an analogy of mm -hmm. how much we should love yeah. him in comparison to everything They have else. to take a back seat. Right. Yeah. And so to, I think to a lot of people who are probably watching this, they're like, well, wait, they have a lot of objections. Mm -hmm. We're not saying these things don't matter no. at all. No. But there's a priority list here. Yeah. And something has to take precedent. Right. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, if those things lead us to stop being the church, yeah. then that's really problematic. Yeah. If we can't function as the church and function in those circles, then that's an issue. Mm -hmm. That that's that's a that's an issue of what is superior and what is inferior. Right. My identity in Christ is in, is superior. Yeah. That means I should be able to meet with my brother, no matter if he thinks different than me on the political spectrum. The gospel should be able to say, you know what? We're still family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's see through this. Mm -hmm. Amen. Final question for you. Um, how do we seek the unity of the body in the midst of a diversity? Um, I mean, the reality is there's a lot of passionate opinions yeah. for, for very good reasons. There's mm -hmm. a lot of passionate opinions about how we interpret everything that we're seeing in our world right now. And it can unintentionally divide us in the church. Mm -hmm. um, based on how we interpret things, how mm -hmm. we perceive things. So how do we seek unity in the context of diversity? How do we, how do we allow for people to, to vent during this time? How mm -hmm. do we allow people to maybe have a kind of a weird opinion? I just, how do we allow for that diversity but still maintain the unity of the body that Jesus prayed for mm -hmm. Uh, in the final days of his ministry. How do we do that? It's the one another's. Bear with one another. Be patient with one another. Love one another. Right? It's reading those scriptures, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, 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 between the weak and the strong, and you don't place the 
uh, the characteristic on who is weak and strong. You know that you're in the body of Christ and that understand the plan that's behind it. Satan is trying to use this to break the body of Christ apart. Yeah. Satan has no other enemy but God. Mm-hmm. So all this stuff, God and his people, right? All this stuff in the background, in the spiritual realm, it's a war between God and Satan. Mm-hmm. Don't let Satan win and take you away from what is so. So the body of Christ, you got to be patient. You got to be loving. You have to seek to understand. You have to have, if you're going to be in the midst of this, you need to be informed from the scriptures. And so I say before you have any conversation, do what you did when you were young and you were a believer. Before, when you were a young believer, before you knew it all, you prayed and you said, God, take me to a place in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Open me up to a scripture or a text. Let me try to understand my brother. I think that we really have to um, um, care um, about one another more than having the conversation with one another. So when I show up with you and we know we're going to be talking about this, I got to love Matt more than being right. Mm -hmm. I got to love Matt more than my perspective. Mm -hmm. Even if I think Pastor Matt needs to have my perspective, if he refuses it, will I still love him? Mm -hmm. If he's not there yet, will I still love him? Mm. If I'm not there yet, will you still love me, mm. right? Mm. So that's one uh, thing. I think that we um, have to be ready to wear the hat of teacher or student. Mm. So many times we're so used to being a teacher in certain things, and then we have to switch to be the student. That's hard, yeah. right? So many times we're the student, and now you might have to take over and be and switch and be the teacher, mm. right? We just, we just have to just, it, it's just love, man. Like, it's those multi-layered uh, um, uh, uh, processes of love. What does it look like that this is happening outside and Christ has not asked me if I wanted to do it, do it if it's nice. He's given me a command to love you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do I do with that, you know? Well, church, I, I think it's um, crucially important as we walk through this season uh, of what's going on in our country to recognize that this is not the first season mm. the Christians have had to endure this kind of a uh, to process to navigate choppy waters and it's not going to be the last right. and frankly it's not going to get any easier yep and so if if we as believers just kind of run to our corners mm-hmm. rather than coming to the table there's not a whole lot of hope for the church. Mm -hmm. We've got to be willing to sit down at the table and talk with people and love each other well Mm -hmm. and hear each other. And um, so church, I I hope uh, as we've had this conversation today that this is a model. Um, Pastor Darren and I are are friends, we are brothers, we love each other, we love each other's families. That's right. right. Our first our firstborn daughters share the same name, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, but we have a genuine friendship, and so we are on the phone frequently, mm-hmm. having these kinds of conversations, and and we hope if you're a person right now that's struggling, wrestling to figure out what's going on in this world, and it's creating distance between you and other believers, just know that's not God's design; mm-hmm. that's the enemy, and the cure is sitting down at the table opening up your Bible and in love yeah. doing what we're doing, right? Yeah, and let me say this to so you. give a great, and, and I want all of your people, my people, our people, family to see this. There are no corners. There's just a communion table. We just sit at the table and the bread and the blood is what brought us together. It's what's, what's going to keep us together. Like God expects for us to always be at the table with one another. Mm. There is, I don't know where, I don't know in the scriptures where God has allowed us to go to a corner. Mm. It says, follow me. Yeah. And we're at the table and, and that's, and, that, and you said it so well that I just had to double down on yeah. that. Be at the communion table with one another as the family of God. And this isn't always going to be easy. No. No, because we're going to have different perspectives, different points of view, different yeah. experiences. But the thing that I appreciate, I mean, you and I, we come from incredibly different backgrounds. Yep. I'm a Midwest guy. Mm-hmm. You're from West Philly. Mm-hmm. So in terms of our experience, there's Technically not... Technically correction, a, I'm from South Philly. My I'm wife sorry. is from West Philly. <laughs> <laughs> Technical correction. Time out, Pastor Gotta Matt. get it right. <laughs> Gotta get it right. But we, could, we couldn't be from more different... Yeah 
backgrounds mm-hmm. and have more different experiences. So maybe our experiential overlap, um, but experience isn't our ultimate authority, no. but it is important, Yeah. but it's not our ultimate authority. And that's what we have as the church. We, we have our ultimate authority here in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And that's why when we, when we look at the world, we, we realize it, it's, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse yep. because they don't know how, they don't have an anchor yeah. the way we do. Yeah. And so we praise God that we have an anchor and that we have the authority of God's word. And so, Pastor Darren, Love you. Thank you. Love you, brother. Thank you for having me. Harvest, love you, church. Thanks, guys. Love you. Until we meet again, you are loved. God bless.